Hello, everybody. This is Twit, and welcome to another episode of the Success Inspired Podcast. My guest today is one of Australia's leading business historians. She has written and published many books on business histories for ASX listed companies, private businesses, and family businesses. She is also the founder of The Book Advisor, one of Australia's leading self-publishing business book mentoring companies. She is one of the most knowledgeable corporate historians and the go-to person for consultants, entrepreneurs, CEOs, directors, and coaches. Basically, anyone who is passionate about their topic and desire to become a published author. Please welcome to the show, Jackie Lane from The Book Advisor. Hello there. How are you? Hi, Jackie. Thanks for uh, making time on the is it Saturday still? Yes, yeah, Saturday. Yeah, it's still Saturday. Great to have you here on the show, Jackie. Tell me, let's get straight into it. What compelled you to become a writer? What's your story? What's my story? Um, <laughs> <laughs> long story. Um, basically, I think I've always been a, a somebody who's interested in reading. So I started, you know, really young, reading a lot. And if you read a lot, you tend to then start writing. And in my case, that's what I did. And um, so I never turned, I never had a passion to be a writer per se, but I love knowledge. I love um, reading and acquiring knowledge and interviewing people and learning. And so the next step on, on that pathway is to um, capture knowledge and write it. And then, then I've moved on to helping other people do that for themselves. And uh, why, why corporate uh... Why corporate history? What, what, that's some, I mean, you've done a lot of that, obviously. Yeah. So that, that must be something that interests you in that topic, yeah, in that good, area. Good question. Um, I'm no good at doing made-up stuff. So, um, you know, I can't draw. I can't, I can't write fairy tales or sci-fi. I guess my background has always been in, you know, school projects and stuff. was always um, collecting factual information and um, sort of mulling it around in my head and finding a different perspective from it. So... I've always been interested in um, factual history and information and and turning that into something that's actually more understandable, to be honest. Mm, mm. And what sort of goes into it? Obviously, research. I would expect lots of research, especially when it comes yeah. to a big companies. And uh, and then, you know, what are typical projects like that? Like I know you've done some work for some banks, big banks, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> some other big corporations. So, what so look, typically um, goes into it? Yeah, so I think whatever you're doing, um, if, you're, if you're in your factual space, there's, there's lots of reading. Firstly, you've got to read a lot. You read around your subject um, from all sorts of different sources. So that's really important that you're not getting all your information from one source. Uh, mm. And then I actually spend a lot of time interviewing people, talking to people. Uh, and it's actually a really wonderful opportunity. And I think it's something that a lot of people don't um, quite understand is that if you're going to write a book about something, it's a great opening line. If you want to go and talk to somebody in your field or even outside your field, if you ring them up and say, hey, I'm writing a book, I'd like to come and talk to you about your knowledge. Mm. Um, people are very open to that. And it's a great way to meet some people that maybe you might feel a bit hesitant to talk to otherwise. Yeah. And, and you can learn a lot. So um, I've interviewed over eight, 900 business people from around the world by picking up the phone and saying, hey, I'm writing a book about X, Y, Z. Um, I'd like to come and have a chat with you. Yeah. There's something um, unique about this. And I must say, I've experienced the same thing with this podcast. Um, just the amount of people just being interested to jump on and, and having a chat. And like you said, having that conversation, having that opportunity to talk to normally you wouldn't maybe have. I mean, it's not like, you know, ring up somebody, hey, can I just talk to you? Yeah. For, for what? But when you say, yeah, well, it's about a book or if it's about a podcast, there's, there's something that um, sort of helps to glue the people together and, and having that conversation. So it's, yeah, it's great. And, yeah. and I think it's about a clear outcome. So for me, um, you know, when I'm commissioned to write a book by a company, there's a very specific outcome, which is usually a published book. So I'm ringing up saying, and if you were doing your own book, you would ring up and say, hey, my name's Ned. I'm planning to do a book about X. Um, I'd like to talk to you about Y because of blah, blah, blah. Um, would you have some time to talk to me? It's, you know, nine times out of 10 people say, of course I will. Yeah. Now let's talk about that. If somebody wanted to write a book, if I wanted to write a book, 
where do I start? Uh, okay, good, good, good question. And um, interestingly, most people that I deal with um, think, oh, I'm going to write a book and they start writing, which is mm. the worst place to start. <laughs> um, because uh, you really have to think um, three key things around that is firstly, um, who are you writing for? So who's your target audience? So my key thing is take yourself out of the equation and stop thinking about you and what you want to say or tell and think about who you're writing for. So who's your target audience? Um, what are their biggest challenges? Um, and then you can work out of all the knowledge that you have what's rele most relevant to them. Mm -hmm. So you need to know who your target audience is. And by the way, that's not someone like you because that's not a target audience. Um, yeah. You know, so work out, do it, you know, create an avatar, do some really good demographic, psychographic research and then understand deeply what their challenges are, what they face every day. So they wake up every morning, what are their biggest challenges? Mm -hmm. And then once you've got that, you can then sort of, you come back into that equation and say, well, of all the knowledge I have, what's the most relevant for, the, for that target audience? Right. Um, and so it's matching that up. And then once you've done that, you can act, that helps you then kind of create a content outline. So you should not start writing anything until you have a clear, um, outline of actually what you're going to write and mm -hmm. so the key subjects and the order in which you're going to write it right, uh, right. so so you've got to do all of that thinking and planning work and once you've done that then you can start writing okay so just back to that what you said is the customer avatar is that something that's applicable to any type of book like absolutely uh, not absolutely. just absolutely not just about how to do this or like a you know one of those uh, manual type of books or how, how you do this. Anything. So, so biographies I have a, yeah, as well. Anything. Okay. So, so I have a client who's written a book about step parenting. Yep. You know, so, you know, so she's a step parent. I said, well, that's fine. Take you out of the equation because not everybody's gone through your personal experience. What are the biggest issues generally for step parents? Not yours specifically, generally. Then mm -hmm. I've got another client who's about to launch a book in a couple of weeks called Brand New, Brand New. And it's about personal branding and yeah. how you have to be constantly looking at your relevance and your reputation. Oh. So, so the thing around that is um, uh, everyone gets so hooked up on what they want to share. And actually, that's not the name of the game. Mm. It's actually focusing on who your target audience is and what their challenges are and how you can help solve them. Right. Because it's like sometimes we tell our story um, from because we've experienced it yeah. um, and we might not realize it, but you know, people who are listening to it or reading that story, they might fully comprehend it because it wasn't really, it wasn't written for them. It was just like sort of writing the story, right? And, and Vid, I think you make a really good point is that, of course, we all have our own experiences, but when you're writing a book, you have to make, you have to find a way to um, focus on w what elements of your experience can, can be useful to other people. Mm -hmm. So just writing your story in its own is not, is not enough because that potentially might not be helpful for other people who've got a different journey, but perhaps may, may be facing some of the same issues. So if you can always focus on your target audience and their challenges, that's a really good guide for um, how you even write what your story is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Perhaps be like a good way to go about it is, you know, writing, writing a story, but always do a bit of a segue from that story. Like, you know, trying to summarize the aha moment and some practicality around what, what should people take out of it kind of thing? Is that you, maybe you a kinda way? You kind of have to do a bit of both. So, yeah. so I say to people, what you need to do is, you know, write down the key knowledge that you have and literally get a piece of paper and fold it in half and on the right-hand side, pop down the, the key knowledge or the key insights that you think you have. Mm -hmm. Then on the left-hand side, what you do is write down the key challenges that you believe that your target audience faces mm -hmm. and then kind of cross match them. And if there's no cross matching, you've got to kind of go back and have another look at it. Yeah. 
so so it's 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 it requires both both of those kind of elements and i guess if especially practical tip if if this Absolutely. is a book that's meant to be helpful um, <laughs> helpful uh, but it's meant to also be used as a as a as a as a as a tool to to build your authority on the market absolutely and and help you with your business right so then you can look at your business and who is the ideal customer in your business and then you can maybe call the people that you've serviced in the past that the ones that you know fall in that common trend the common uh, avatar and ask them absolutely. what they struggle with right and then you can write for that and and a big thing for me that is don't assume don't assume that you know everything mm. about your target audience so you probably are quite knowledgeable about them but i i always recommend people go off and go and ask those questions so that you you kind of you're not always in this space of this is my knowledge and this is what i'm going to tell the world whether they like it or not mm. <laughs> you actually have to stand back from you and say well i need to go out and find out really if my gut instincts are right or wrong because yeah. if you do that process really thoroughly your book will be way better it will sell better and it will work better for you absolutely i actually had a good conversa uh, conversation on that on topic of you know customer avatar with uh, uh, one of my previous guests tim hyde okay. who you know helps people uh, plug the holes in their uh, sales funnels and we talked about avatars i know said, i know tim well uh, do yes you? yes i do <laughs> small world That's awesome. And uh, one thing you said, you know, you can look at all your customers that you had in your business, but you really want to target the ones that have stayed with you the longest because they yeah. are the ones that really love your business. Yeah. So, you know, try and, try and narrow it down and really focus, get that, you know, give them that time, get on a phone call and ask them, hey, what was it? Why did you, you know, why did you stick around for so long? What, what did you particularly enjoy about the way I, we do what we do? and gather that knowledge and it's not about the numbers it's about the quality of the conversation so you might 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 just be 10 20 you know people that have been you know your longest um customers yeah but the information you get from that is is very valuable because you can then really create that avatar specifically because you know those those 10 they are the ones that you want to replicate you want more of those 10 absolutely and i think the other really interesting thing around that bit is that um, you know, I mean, by nature, my business, I don't necessarily get repeat customers. Sometimes mm. I do, but not really. Um, but of course, my current, my clients, past and current, are constantly talking about their journey with me with other people that they know. Absolutely. Um, and so, so at least half of my business comes through referral. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And uh, so, so that's, you know, that's a really not underrated area, but um, if you know your type of your audience and your customer really well you've got that relationship with you that keep, they keep working for you mm. so now we're writing the book okay we've got an avatar where do we go next do we look at chapters do we look at uh, how do we how do we create that structure okay of so, so so you've kind of done that right and left side of the piece of paper kind of exercise yeah you've worked out that you've got some common things between your knowledge and their challenges Then, then you use that to actually help you create a content outline. Um, so you actually write a content outline um, and you fiddle around that for a while and there's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of ways you can do that. But effectively, you end up with a, um, an, a kind of rough content outline of what you're going to write. Is that and kind of like when you're making a mind map? And like just yeah, sort of you can call it a mind map or it could look, look like the contents page of a book. You know, whatever, yep. if you're a visual person, you might have, I've got clients who use um, post-it notes and stick them up on the wall and move yep. the post-it notes around kind of different columns. Mm -hmm. And so whatever way you want to work, um, you group things together and those groupings become chapters yep. um, and you fiddle around with that until you're comfortable with it. And, and then basically once you're comfortable with that, that's when you can start writing. Yeah. Because once you, once you got the outlines, you got that's the it. topics, then writing the detail of it, it's not so hard. Correct. Correct. So again, most people, you know, just start writing without any clear idea of who their target audience is, what the knowledge is or the challenges. And then they get stuck because it feels easy, but then they kind of, they don't have a structure. They don't have an order. And then they get stuck and then they stop. And then, and then the worst thing that happens is, oh, I can't write. Mm. Well, it's not that they can't write. They just haven't actually planned it properly. 
It's like anything. You got to have a plan. Whether totally. it's trying to get fit and lose weight, you have to have a plan. Or whether it's your business, you're trying to achieve better Absolutely. ROI or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and books and, and, and writing books exactly the same. Now, what are some of the other typical obstacles? So, one, not having a plan. What are some of the other obstacles uh, for somebody? You know, getting that results in getting stuck with completing the book. Um, I, I call it the F F factor. Yeah. Um, um, whatever, whatever way you want to call the F word. Uh, yep. But but the for, for in writing, it's the fear factor. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, lots of people, most people, um, are, are fearful. So I've dealt with chairmen of companies, of CEOs, um, consultants who you know have their own businesses. And a really interesting thing is most of us, um, whilst we have great knowledge and insights or think we do, when it comes to feeling like we are an authority enough to write it down, we become fearful, um, fearful that we're not going to be good enough, that our peer group will not like what we've written, that we can't write well. Um, we have imposter syndrome that who am I to write a book? Um, you know, so why would anyone listen to me? What happens if someone doesn't like what I've written? Uh, what happens? I can't, I don't write really well. So huge amounts of fear and I of often, emotional stuff. yeah, totally emotional. And I often use the analogy of an artist. Yeah. An artist might spend a year painting all his work or her works and, and getting ready for a big gallery opening and all the works are hung up in the gallery and, and the opening night, they go into the gallery in, you know, incognito so no one knows who they are and they're walking around the gallery and they're listening to people comment on their paintings and they hear people say, oh, God, that's amazing, you know, and other people say, oh, that's dreadful, you know, I, my yeah. three-year-old could do better than this. Um, and writing a book is you're putting yourself out there to the world forever. Mm. That's huge. That is and, huge, yeah. And, Just like this podcast, I mean, that's going to stay. Yeah, you know, so, um, and it's permanent. Yeah. You know, even if it's an ebook, it's permanent. Mm. So basically what you're doing is you're saying to the world, here's my views about X subject take me on <laughs> pretty much you know and and so i say to all my writers well no everybody's not going to agree with you so get ready for that um you're not putting yourself out as the world expert what you're doing is sharing your knowledge your point of view your but- point of view your insight so the fear factor is huge it's the biggest biggest challenge most people face also sometimes it could be uh, worrying too much about the um, the information being up to date later in the future, right? Uh, y- yes and no. Although, really, we're all human beings, you know. Um, and there's not too many things. Whilst situations might change, mm. um, human beings and emotions and how we feel about things, um, you know, there are, there are kind of there are some kind of given kind of um, thoughts and processes that we go through um, specific knowledge is for industry. Sure. You know, and um, but it's more about helping people to um, overcome their own challenges about how they deal with stuff, whatever, mm. whatever sector you're in. It seems like the commonality of that could maybe funnel down to one simple word and that is insecurity, maybe. T- feeling partly, insecure partly you know absolutely and um you know i've written 19 books and and i'm commissioned to write books so that's part of what i do and so i'm pretty i think i'm pretty good at it and um and when i send when i hit the send button for a client when i've maybe spent three months six months 12 months researching and writing a book mm. and i have to send the client the first draft which, by the way, is probably my fifth or sixth draft, but yep. to them it's the first draft. I usually have to go for a walk around the park and come home and have a glass of wine before I hit the send button. Um, and I'm a professional, yep. you know. So, so that 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 act of sending what you've done 
even if it's just to one other person or if it's in a book out to the world, of course it's about insecurity. Mm. It's, you know, is this good enough? What are they going to think about it? What happens they don't like it? Um, what am I going to do with that? If they come back and say, oh, we don't really like what you've done, Jackie, you know, how do I, how do I deal with that? Yeah. Um, and I remember once I sent a manuscript off to a client, which has taken me 12 or 18 months, and I didn't hear back from them for like six weeks. You know, so I'm like, at this point, I'm just going, this is a disaster. Yeah. You know, this is just awful. They hate it, you know, and, and in the end I rang them up because they hadn't rung me. And I said, oh, look, I'm just making sure you got it. Oh, yeah, we love it. We think it's fantastic. And I'm going, great, you could have told me. Yeah. <laughs> so I had six weeks of pain and six weeks of insecurity. Mm. Um, big one. Big topic, communication, lack of yeah. communication. Yeah. So many times I've uh, myself experienced that just broken chain of communication. People forget to well, respond and then we make our own stories and yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that you make a really good point and, you know, I deal a lot with companies and storytelling and mm. um, how you can use storytelling in business. And, and one of the things I say is that if you are not putting out your company story to either internally or externally, there is a story that is being made. It's just that it's not yours. So, mm. you know, people fill a vacuum. So if you don't have a clear story, whoever you are or whatever your business is, other people are making one up. So you need one because if you don't, somebody else is. And it's more than likely not the one you want. And also I think it's very effective method uh, when it comes to uh, marketing, like using stories and analogies. Because uh, people relate to that. If you're trying to promote a product or a service and it's just bullet points and features and benefits, it's not going to be relatable as much as if you do add some, some stories around it and make it personal. Mm. Yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, human beings are storytellers, you know, we, we, that's how we learn. That's how we find context in life. Um, and we find our own place in bigger stories. So that's fundamentally who we are. Now, if we had to summarize it, what are the, let's say five things that, um, you know, somebody needs to do before starting and writing their book? Uh, well, so we've, we've covered some of them. Um, yep. But, and one we didn't cover though is what's your purpose? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. let's go to that first. Yep. Yeah, you know, why are you writing the book? Um, do you want to be a multimillionaire bookseller? Do you want to be a speaker? Do you want to change the world? Do you want to share your knowledge? Do you want to use it to build your brand? So understanding what your purpose is is super critical. Um, because you will be making a whole bunch of decisions around your book based on what the outcome you want it to achieve. Yeah. Uh, so that's number one. Um, two, we've chatted about who's your target audience. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of put aside to the fact that you've got knowledge. We know that if you're knowledgeable about your industry, that's a given. So, but what's not a given is understanding your target audience and what their challenges are. And that's where most writers, uh, business writers fail because they don't do that step. Mm -hmm. um, number three is, um, you know, what specific knowledge do you have fits that target audience's challenge? Yeah. Because most business people, if they don't do that, they've got so much knowledge and all they, they go, Bleh, they just spit it all out. And yeah, quite and frankly, it's most of it's, it's not structured and most of it's not relevant. The fourth thing is that you actually have to commit. Uh, you know, you'd know that in, in the fitness yeah, yeah. thing. Let's talk um, about that. That's a, commit, that's a commitment. Yeah. Uh, so I can't tell you the number of people who've said to me, and I say, what do you do? And I said, I'm a writer and I help people write their books. Oh, I've always wanted to write a book. I go, great. When are you going to start? Uh, so the commitment factor is huge um, because not only do you have to commit to writing your book, but you're probably having to commit to self-publish it and then market it. Right. And so most people get focused on the writing part, but to produce your book and then market it, that alone is like a 12 month exercise. Mm. So you've probably spent six to eight months writing it and then you've got another 12 months ahead. So if, so you have to be clear, you have to be committed. Now, I'm interested to know, you know, 
again, bringing it back to, to fitness because that's where I'm coming from. If yeah. you're trying to achieve a certain goal and you know you get into a new journey, you're about to change a couple yeah. of habits, whether it's exercise or nutrition or whatever. One thing that works is you know you 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 let the world know you know you you let your friends know you yep. let your you know loved ones know people that um that support you and you let them know because that's going to make you accountable that's one yes, good strategy the accountability you know? factor yeah yeah the other one is obviously creating a plan sticking to it and um but i think the big one is accountability is is this something that applies to a book as well or is the, or and are there additional strategies that you recommend for somebody okay to stick in to it? Yeah, so accountability is a big one. Um, and I'd say probably about a third of my clients um, come and work with me because they need the accountability. They, they, they know that that's what they need, that they, they can't do it on their own, um, mm -hmm. that they need someone to keep them accountable. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's part of what we do. And, and in terms of strategy around that, when I'm talking to people about coming on the program, I say, I actually don't want you to come on the program unless you can commit to spending six hours a week over eight months. Yeah. And I said, and if you can't do that now, don't join the program because you will not achieve what you need to um, in the period of time and I won't, and, and there's the, I can't make you do that. Um, and then you'll feel disappointed and that's not a good outcome for either of us. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so I don't want people coming onto the program if they're not going to complete because that's not a good outcome Yeah. Um, for me and certainly not for them. And so the part of the, the strategy around that is, if you need to be able to spend two to three lots of two to three hours a week. So it becomes something that goes into your diary. So I don't care when you do it. It could be 2 a.m. in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a couple of times a week, and you lock it into your calendar every week for eight months. Mm -hmm. That way you know that's your writing time or your book time. Your colleagues know, your family, everybody knows that this is your time that you are going to be doing this mm -hmm. because otherwise it gets bumped. Something yeah. always comes in over the top um, and it doesn't, it doesn't happen. This is essentially a new habit that you need to get Absolutely. used to doing, right? So Absolutely. initially, initially before you, you never written a book, now you've written a book. So I guess, how do you start? This is a task. So initially, it's a task. You yep. set it up. Okay. Two, three, you say two, three lots of yep. two hour blocks, right? Now, I want to ask you about our two hour blocks and specifically why. But yep. to get, uh, but um, yeah, so you set it up, you schedule it in. And like any habits, they say it takes about what, six weeks to form a, a habit. So then oh, it I changes. Think, I think it's longer, actually. I actually did some research on this for a client because everyone says, oh, you know, 21 days or whatever days. Yeah. And I actually said to my client, I said, how did you get that figure? Oh, well, that's what someone said. And me being the researcher and said, hang on a minute, I'll just go and find out. Um, so I did a bunch of research around it. And depending on what the habit is, it can be between 66 and 138 days. Mm. Interesting. Okay. That is interesting. Yeah. So now you've formed the habit. Now, the two-hour blocks, I'm interested to know, is this because this is a creative process? And that requires, I've heard this thing, right? Um, this concept where if you're trying to, if, you, if you're doing a creative task, it takes a good 15 minutes before your brain sort of gets into those waves, into that focus zone where you're actually really focusing on the task, being creative. And, and, and that's why you need those two hours because it takes a while before you, yeah, before you dive into that zone. Um, so... I haven't researched that, but that's um, pretty much. Uh, so I, I say two hours because it takes a period of time mm. to get your head into it, um, whether it's 15 minutes or half an hour. And if you're writing a book or researching a book, typically you have to be in a space where you've got to pull out all your notes again mm -hmm. or down, you know, open up your documents on your computer, um, you kind, of, kind of read a bit, you've got to do a bit of thinking. So you're likely to spend 15 
anywhere between 15 minutes and half an hour, just kind of reorganizing yourself. Mm. Um, and then, then you've got an hour and a half yeah. to write. So if you're only, if you're only allowing yourself an hour, even if it was an hour, five times a week, you'd only really get a half an hour of productive writing time, which is not enough because you can't progress enough yeah, in okay. half an hour. So then uh, if you have a too short a period of time, at the end of a couple of weeks you go, God, I've only written like, you know, a thousand words and I've spent all this time, mm. but you've actually only spent probably a third of that time writing. Which can sort of sabotage your motivation of if you're not seeing does. that progress. Of course it does. So again, it's about being efficient with how you spend your time. Um, so ideally you should have one block or two blocks of three hours. That would be better. Yeah. But it's, pr it's probably unrealistic for most people. Um, and, and going to a cafe and saying, oh, I'm going to sit in the cafe and out write for an hour. Sorry, doesn't work. No, um, I don't think so. You know, going on holiday and saying, oh, I'm going to write my book on my holiday. Doesn't work. There's too many, uh, too many distractions. Yeah. Um, think, and, and it's about yeah. being productive in the time that you have. I think, I think for me, anything like that, what works for me is waking up like, you know, really early in the morning before I've done anything else for the yep. day. Because if you try and do it at the end of the day, I mean, if you can, good luck, good luck to you. Well done. But uh, for me, it, at the end of the day, I've, my brain is fried. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think you make a very good point that so um, it, it depends on your own lifestyle and also what other commitments you have. So if you're a consultant and you run a business and you've got some staff, virtual or, or real kind of thing, you might have family. Um, if you're doing school pickup or drop off or, you know, whatever is in your life, um, uh, you've got to find two, two to three lots of two hours a week. Yeah. I don't care when they are. Ideally, they should be the same days every week. Yeah. Again, so everybody around you knows that, oh, you know, dad's working on his book or mum's working on her book. Everybody starts understanding that that's your time and you start understanding that. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like that collective little exercise uh, because you can't write a book on your own, oddly. I mean, you are on your own, <laughs> but you need everybody else around you to support to, you, to give you the space. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you can't allow anybody to distract you as no. well. Because it goes back to those 15 minutes. That's the other thing I heard is somebody distracts you and you're in that big focus zone. Back again. Back again. Another 15 to 30 minutes before you yep. go back to that maximum focus. Yep. So, so whilst you're in that zone, turn your phone off, turn the, you know, not on, don't have it on, on, you know, vibrate or light, turn the messaging off on your computer um, get your cup of tea, go to the toilet, do the veggie patch, walk, the, do everything you need to do before you sit down. And when you sit down, you do nothing else. Yeah. And if you're struggling with focus and anything that can help, right? It could be a coffee, yeah. could be um, one Chocolate. of the... <laughs> I, I've been using um, one of the essential oils. I just purchased yep. some essential oils yep. and I've got a particular one that's got a combination of a few yep. essential oils in it. It's specific for focus. It's great. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, and look, and some people, I mean, I often listen to music when I write um, and depending on my mood, it could be classical music and Yo-Yo Ma or Freddie Mercury, mm. you know, and sometimes it's soft and sometimes it's loud kind of whatever works for you yeah but you have to it you need two hours minimum two hours music is interesting one sometimes i find you know playing techno music like dj just like really fast pumping yeah. beats i get in focus but the other times i can't absolutely listen to anything because anything that plays in my ear is just distracting me and i can't focus it's it's really weird <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of an unusual. Anyway, that's a very personal thing, but yeah, um, yeah avoid distractions. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you mentioned it goes a lot um, when it comes to publishing and, and the marketing. Uh, can we elaborate a little bit? Just give a bit of an insight what goes sure, into the sort of process. Sure, sure. So, so basically, let's say you're going through writing your book. Yeah, you finished your first draft and you might have, and, and by the way, you need to revise your first draft three or four times. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you just don't send that off to a printer. So most people need to get, well, everybody needs to get their book proofread. So it needs to go to somebody who proofreads it for grammatical things and punctuation and spelling. Um, and I've been writing for 30 years and I have a proofreader that proofreads everything I do. Uh, some people will need to get their book edited, which is yep. a structural thing. And, and they def everybody needs to get their book proofread. Um, and then you have to get your book laid out like, you know, it has to go from words into like um, the pages of a book. So that's, you know, that's called internal page layout. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole process on its own. And you have to get the cover of your book designed. And then you have to work out whether you want to have a printed book or an e-book. Um, and there's different versions of printed books and e-books. Um, so there's a whole kind of mechanical and production process that goes on um and i could spend hours talking about that yeah, itself yeah. and and then say so we pop out the other end of that and whether you're on amazon or you've got a print on demand or an ebook the reality is there's only one person that's going to market your book and that's you mm -hmm. pretty much um, and you need to start planning how you're going to market that your book and what you're going to do a good three or four months before your book even delivered yeah so whilst you're right in the middle of this whole production part of your book you have to start building your databases and creating a content marketing plan and a media list and a promo list and so the whole bunch of things that go into having a really good marketing plan for your book <clears throat> yeah. um, because really it's actually just a tool for your business it just happens to be a book um, or it's a tool to promote you and your brand. And if you want to become a speaker or you want to become a, not, you know, um, a person the media goes to, um, you have to start planning that quite early, which is part of the reason I said really early on, you have to be very clear about what your purpose is. Because if you're clear about your purpose, that then starts informing what your marketing plan is going to do, yeah. you know, what you want to achieve and where you're going to spend your time and your money. So, yeah, you've finished writing your book and everyone goes, yay, I've written my book. And I'm going, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah. You've got to produce it and you've got to market it. Yeah. And to clarify here, this is not just posting some stuff on your Instagram or oh, no. Facebook, right? Oh, no. <laughs> this is like a 12 to 18 month full on content marketing plan yeah. with SEO across all the, all the platforms that you want to go combined with a media plan and a marketing plan. Can you reverse engineer it? Can you, for example, have a, a blog, you know, website, business, uh, and, book, and a blog? Point. Yeah. Um, so I've had a client who's produced a book based on his blogs. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can, um, but you can't just copy and paste it. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's kind of a bit of a misnomer. Someone said, oh, I've written all these blogs. I'm just going to turn them into a book. And I said, well, why? You know, why are you doing it? Who's your target audience? What are they? You just have that whole conversation again. Um, and I said, and if also if I've had all that information, why would they buy the book? Um, and what are you trying to achieve with it? You know, so mm. you end up have, kind of you do have to circle back. Yeah. But at least if you have your content or a version of it, you've got something to start with, as opposed mm. to having nothing. Now, what about having an agent? I've, I'm hearing some people, you know, they, 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 they write a book, but yep. they've got an agent or a publisher, and then they're okay. actually restricted with, you know, they're actually being told what it needs to look like, and then they okay. sort of lose that, uh, what do you say? They lose the, uh, the, crea the creators, you know, yep. opportunity to make it look the way they want it to make it look. Okay, so good point. The mainstream publishing industry works, um, mainstream publishers do not accept unsolicited manuscripts. Um, I think J.K. Rowling sent her first manuscript for Harry Potter off to 150 publishers and got rejections letters for all but one of them. That's um, what you say, unsolicited? Yeah. So, so you, you know, writing a book, you write something, you send it off to publishers. Um, most of them won't even return, won't even reckon, you know, they, they get thousands of them. So, you, so what's, what's come about um, is that there's agents um, who people try and find and trying to find an agent so it's an art form in itself who kind of act as the go between between a writer and the publisher and the agent will have a relationship with some publishers 
There's um, trust. And, and, they, and they become known as an agent who specialises in fitness books or, or um, leadership <clears throat> books. Mm-hmm. And so the agent knows which publishers are interested in which topics. Um, and if you can get the agent to take you on, because the agents are a bit like the publishers, they don't take many on because they only want to take manuscripts on that they think that they can pitch to publishers. Yeah, makes sense. And they then take a chunk of change for doing that. <laughs> um, so you have a middleman between there. And, um, and then that might take six months. It might take a year. And they take a portion um, of the money. And so if you do get a agent and a publisher, um, a publisher then takes on all the cost of the editing, the design, the production, getting it into bookshops. So that's the big plus. Um, but as the writer, you would be lucky to get between 5 and 7% of the recommended retail price as your cut. Yeah, that's the um, downside of it. And so you don't get much money. You might get the kudos of being in a bookshop. But again, if your purpose is not necessarily to sell box, books through a bookshop, your purpose might be to develop your brand and your profile and to develop a database you wouldn't be going that way anyway. You'd sell it off your own website because that way you capture people's emails yeah. and you can, and, and it becomes a tool to start a relationship as opposed to just a transaction to sell a book. And you've got more control and more flexibility got, to... Yeah, and, and clearly gonna... if a publisher takes your book on, they will be ch- they'll decide what the title is, what the cover is. They'll do the editing because they're the one putting up all the money to, to do it. Um, so it's understandable, yeah. but, but again, it comes back to what's your purpose mm. um, and being really clear on that. Cause you will be making a whole bunch of different decisions based on that. Now, what about Amazon? Is that a good place to place your book? <laughs> yeah. T- no, nah, well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you think getting into a bookshop's hard and selling a book out of a bookshop, try Amazon. Um, yeah. again, what's your purpose? Um, if your purpose is to grow your business through creating a relationship and then nurturing a relationship, if you sell your book on Amazon, you have no idea who's bought your book because they do not provide you the details of purchases. Mm. Um, and also they act like a traditional publisher. They don't give you much money back either. So that's not, it's not cheaper. So you still only get maybe 10% of the recommended retail price. Right. Um, and you have no, and you have no idea who's bought your book, and maybe you don't care. That's fine. Um, so again, if you want to use your book as a tool to grow your business, start building a database. If you're using it as a tool to start a relationship rather than just selling a copy of a book to a person, um, why would you go onto Amazon? Um, conversely, Amazon's got millions, hundreds of millions of books. How's mm. somebody going to find your book there? So unless you're doing all the marketing, hello, it always comes back to you. You've got to do the legwork and the marketing to get people to know your book exists. And then after you've done all of that, you're going to send them to a third party where you have no idea about any information about who bought it so you can't create a relationship with them. Yeah, unless you put a little hook inside the book so they have to take action, the readers have to take action to get back to you. And, oh, so you and look, and, and, and you can do that too, but that's, that's a once removed step. And I'm not saying don't do Amazon, um, but you need to be very clear about the strategy of why you want to be on Amazon and what your expectations are about what it's going to do for you. Um, and I had a client who said, I want to have an Amazon bestseller. Yeah, I was going to say that's a that's a and, that's just a strategy so you can say you're a bestseller, right? Yeah, and and I said, well, why? She said, I just want to, and I said, okay, I can show you how to game the Amazon bestseller yeah, thing. Yeah, heard of that. And um and she became an Amazon bestseller in five days, and she yeah. sold fifteen books. Yeah, no, and, and that's fine, that. and that's fine. That's what she wanted yeah. to do, and it helps with her marketing. Um, so. I wouldn't say don't do Amazon, obviously, but you need to be very clear about why you want to do it and what outcome you want from it. Yeah. 
There's so uh, many, there's so many strategies you could utilize book for promotion. I even know a guy who in America, Russell Branson, who, yes. who runs the quick, uh, quick funnels. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Right. And he had a really cool one. I've got the book here somewhere. I think we've all got Russell's books. <laughs> it was a free book. You just pay for That's the shipping. Exactly right. But such a smart. And he's now got a series of five. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, so he's used his book purely as a marketing yeah. tool um it doesn't sell them as you said you know he, there's a there's a price on them but he uses them as a lead generator and a marketing tool mm. again goes back to this thing purpose target audience what do, you know what are your outcomes that's it i wonder whether that actually covered his cost oh, of the sure. book oh. are a book expensive to print uh, well, he does print on demand, so he doesn't have any stock. Right. So if someone orders a book, Amazon just prints it and sends it. That's good. Um, so he ho- he holds no stock. He doesn't care whether he in Zvetacoma sells it because people sign up for his program, and that's where that's he right. makes that's where he makes his money. And for the software that he's got, yeah. Correct. So he he doesn't care. Again, it's about his strategy is very clear. Yeah. His book is part of a strategy. You give a stuff whether he sells one or not. Mm. So it's a kind of an interesting thing that about about books. People kind of see books as some special kind of thing, but and I think they are. I love them, but in fact, they're more actually a a, a, a marketing tool to use, provided you know how to use them. Mm. So I think we've covered everything there is from the beginning to the end. When it there comes to go. books. Now, <laughs> for the for the next part of this podcast, I'd like to focus on you. Oh, no. <laughs> That's dangerous. All right. So I, I think we provided a lot of value right now in the last sort of 40 minutes to to listeners when it comes to the books. And um, if they want to know more, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do a plug at the end. But I'd like to know um, what has been the most difficult um, obstacle that you had to face in your life, Jackie? Uh, I've had several. Um, from a business perspective, I had a business publishing company for 24 years. And when the GFC came along, I actually had to wind that business up. Mm. Uh, and at the time I had 30 staff and a turnover of $6 million. And in literally within six months, I ended up with no staff and nothing. Wow. That hurts. Um, yeah. And, and I'd always been successful at everything I'd ever done. And I'd never asked anybody for help. In fact, people came to me because I was the person who helped everybody else. So I, I say to people, it was a really great learning experience. It's not an experience I would recommend, but I learned a lot out of it. And, and I learned how to ask people for help. Now, when I have you know guests on my show, I like to do you know, a bit of preparation. I mean what kind of a host would I be if I didn't, right? Now, is that true that when you were 12, you wanted to become New Zealand's first female prime minister? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and I am a New Zealander, so I didn't want to be the New Zealand prime minister from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I did. I, um, um, I, I, my parents were quite active locally in politics. And, and as a young kid, I used to get on a bicycle and put out you know, um, pamphlets yep. in letter. So I was quite, came from a politically active family. Yep. And yeah, I decided that I wanted to go into politics at a really young age and that if I was going to do that, that I was going to be New Zealand's first woman prime minister. Wow. And, and, I, and I did a master's degree in politics and I went and worked for a political party for three years and, and then got offered a very safe seat for that political party. So um, I was well on my way to doing that. And, and then when I got offered that safe seat, and so I was 25, and I thought, oh, mm. I actually don't, I don't want to be public. I'm a very private person. I thought, I actually don't want to live my life in the public eye. So I declined the offer, which is a huge one because that's all I'd ever wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and then a segue when, from that, you took a gap year or something like that when I uh, travelled? No, no, no. The head of the political party at the time said, well, look, why, I've got this research job that needs doing in, in Australia. Why don't you go over there for a couple of years and research and write this book 
and and then you know come back and I said oh, okay that sounds like an idea so mm. I came over to Australia I didn't know anybody here to do to start this project and I never went back that's interesting so that's that's where your that's where your career started it, yep. it found, found you you didn't it found find me it. correct that's amazing so, and that project was a project for the Stock Exchange mm-hmm. to research and write a book on the history of entrepreneurship in Australia. What is the book called? Champions of Enterprise. I'll definitely put in the show notes. I'm interested to. Yeah, uh, it's to actually out that. of print. It's actually out of print. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm trying to find the time to update it. But basically, I spent three years running around Australia interviewing all of Australia's leading business people. Mm. So, that was the segue into my business. And that would have been an excellent uh, networking opportunity as well, oh, building lots of great relationships. Fabulous, fabulous. And some of those people that I met, I've, I've done written books for, published books for, and are still people that I, I, I stay in touch with even today. That's amazing. So obviously, you're very good at what you do. You've been publishing books for the last 30, 30 years, you've built lots of great relationships. Jackie, what are you not good at? <laughs> What am I not good at? I'm not good at playing the saxophone. Um, uh, uh, what? <laughs> I'm learning to play the saxophone. Okay. Um, and I'm not very good at it because I don't practice enough. Mm. Um, so, so I'm not very good at that. Um, and um, I'm not very good at um, not sharing my opinion. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of very direct. I'm known to be very direct and yeah. I have an opinion on most things. So I'm learned, tr- I'm not great at not sharing. Ah, <laughs> uh, at not sharing. Okay. And not sharing. <laughs> I think it's a you know, fine balance between both, both cases, between yeah. sharing and not sharing. Yeah. But and, I'm, um, yeah. I'm getting, Sorry? getting, I'm getting better. <laughs> Now, why saxophone? What, what, why, why is it something like a, just a bit of a hobby? Just want to give um, it a go? Or? Look, every year on my birthday, I um, learn something new. I decide the next year that I'm going to learn something new. And um, so I used to play musical instruments when I was younger. Uh-huh. And, um, and I played the piano and then I played the flute and then I just stopped playing any musical instrument. And I've always kind of liked the saxophone. So a couple of years ago, I thought, Oh, you know, I really want to learn to play a saxophone. So um, I was chatting with my osteopath, actually, and and he said, what are you doing for your birthday? And I said, oh, I want to learn the saxophone. He said, well, my son's just finished learning. I've got one. You can have it. (laughs) There you go. So I said, okay, well, that's great. And so I went off and got saxophone lessons. (laughs) That's great, yeah. So cool. every, yeah, every year I go and I go, I pick something that I don't know and I go and learn it. I, I really like that. I'm going to apply that because uh, there's a, you know, uh, there's a couple of things that I'd like to learn myself. Uh, one being languages. I oh, always yeah. wanted to learn yep. another language. So yeah, that's a, that's a great, great thing. Uh, you know, so I've been, to- I've been learning Arabic now for four years. So that was one of my, one of my birthday years things is I wanted to learn Arabic. Yeah, I was going to say these things are not like you don't you don't just set yourself twelve months, right? It's no, like, no, no, no. You wouldn't be able to do Arabic. That uh, I would be, that would take a couple of years for sure. Oh no, so yeah, so it's not like I only you learn them for twelve months. So you, you keep stacking up new new things correct. on top. Co- so, correct. Wow, that's a ends up being a, keeping you really busy, I guess. <laughs> well, it does, but it's great. Now, um, what do you wish you had known when you started your business? Um. I'd wish I'd known my numbers better, my business numbers better. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was fortunate that I had a business partner who was a very, who was a senior businessman. Um, so he taught me how to read a balance sheet, a P and L about cash flow, um, and and various things. But that happened over years, um, and and I re- and even then I didn't really pay enough attention to margin profitability. You know, there were some key numbers that um, I really didn't know, didn't know. And because mm. he kind of ran the back end of the business, I didn't, inverted commas, didn't need to know. Um, had I learnt them and known them, I would have been in much better shape pre-GFC. Not sure that, it, not sure it would have changed things radically. Um, but, I, yeah, I should have known my, the key numbers that mattered for my business 
to run a profitable business that had enough um, leeway in it to 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 deal with the um, the black swan event like a COVID or a GFC. Yeah, yeah. So I learned that lesson the hard way, and um, I've reconfigured my businesses. I know exactly my numbers. I know exactly what margin, what profitability I need. Um, and that's standing me in very good stead right now. Yeah, absolutely. That's so important. A lot of, a, lot of, a lot of starting businesses don't set their pricing right. They don't charge what they're worth and they don't, they don't set the pricing, uh, sorry, the, 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 the profit margin big yep. enough to account for all these things. That's absolutely. So, so um, yeah, didn't know my numbers. Now, Tell me, what's true that no nobody else agrees with you on? <laughs> I can't remember what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I wrote that one. I answered that one. Got you there. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Oh, no, I do know. I do know. Um, uh, nobody agrees that I should have a compost and a worm farm. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a bit of a greenie, so I, had a, I have yep. a veggie patch. Um, and I don't use um, uh, pesticides or herbicides, so I do companion planting, and yeah. and I have two composts and two worm farms. And pretty much everybody I know um, doesn't just doesn't get the fact that I'm I running think, a compost and a worm farm. Yeah, I think that's excellent. Actually, one of my friends in Sydney, he was showing me on his backyard. He's got a full hydroponic setup. Yep. And he's you know you know he's got spring onions and all the veggies. And firstly. And everything grows really fast. Yep. And and it's clean. Like there's no there's no soil, it's just water and just the nutrients. And he told me that um, you know, there's a set setup where you can have worms next to it and then you just oh, sort okay. of feed the worms and then yep. their um what do you call it? What they you know their castings, worm yeah. castings. They're called yeah. castings. And then, yeah, and then yeah. you use that to go yeah. through the hypophonic. Um, so actually worm poop, really. It's just yeah. worm poop. But it won't poop and then you grow <laughs> spring onions. Correct. There you go. But it's very, very green, very ecologic, actually. Yep. Yep. So Excellent. that's what I do. Well, Jackie, we it's been a pleasure having you on this episode. It's been a good hour. Wow, it's gone quickly. <laughs> It get far, time goes faster when we have a good conversation, and, and indeed it was. Um, I've learned lots of great new things, and I'm sure listeners did as well. But if somebody wants to learn more and get in touch with you, how can people find you? Oh, look, I'm I'm an old fashioned kind of girl, but um, people can give me a call on o four double zero eight triple zero five six. Yeah, right. Public um, like that. <laughs> yeah, just like that. It's an old phone. I'm just number. gonna add. I'm just going to add for those listeners listening from around yeah. the world, you just have to add plus 61 because it's Australia. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Um, lots of zeros in that. Or, or email me um, yeah. on Jackie, which is J-A-Q-U-I. There's no C in it. Um, mm-hmm. So Jackie at the book advisor, uh, com.au. And I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so find me at Jackie Lane. You'll find me all over LinkedIn. Very busy on LinkedIn. Or that's my awesome. website, which is thebookadvisor.com.au. Mm-hmm. Super, super. I'm going to make sure I'll put it all in the show notes. Now, one last thing. Um, we like to reward our listeners with some special offer from our guests. Um, what have you got for us today, Jackie? Okay. So um, on the 1st of July, I'm actually launching a uh, my first online program, uh, which is really exciting. Cause that is I'm, exciting. Yeah. So I I've I've, haven't done that before. And um, it's usually um, one ninety seven a month, and for your listeners, they um, or whatever they can they can um, pick up that offer for one hundred and twenty seven dollars a month um, over eight months. So um, that's a that's a super duper offer. That is and, great. And and they can be the first people to join the the online program. And that's an online program to help somebody publish a book. Uh, to to write, plan, write, publish, and market their book. Yeah. Everything. Based Everything. On- 30 years of your experience. I know, I know. Yeah, very exciting. And and the, that includes monthly webinar, workbooks, templates, checklists, um, a whole bunch of stuff and support from our team. And and I assume you also help people and, and you leverage off your network to help somebody oh, of, publish your book, right? I, yeah, of course I do. I've got a whole bunch of... That's a priceless. Um, yeah, e- e- editors, proofreaders, and and designers, and printers, and yeah. people in marketing, and all sorts of things. 
Now, for anybody listening, this is where the real value comes in. You, you don't build relationships like that over a day. And Jackie has been able to build over 30 years. So if you jump onto a program, she'll, she'll, she'll help you go from the A to Z, you know, get that book out there and help you leverage, you know, um, put it in front of the right people uh, with you know, whatever you need to get the book out there with the right strategy and all that. Now, there's a special promo code, I believe, that we've set up for the listeners. Yes, I think we're going to. Call it success inspired. Funny let's call that. It that. Yeah, yeah, let's call it success inspired. Actually, success inspired podcast. So if you ah, guys okay. put yep. a success inspired podcast, you click on the link. I'm going to put it in the show notes and you get through to Jackie to get on the program. Just mention that promo code and you get 30. Is that 30% off? Is that what we yeah, roughly. Yeah, pretty much. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we're at the end. Jackie, one last question for you. Oh, no. Yes. Any, que- <laughs> <laughs> Any question I should have asked that I didn't? Um, who's my favorite author? Who is it? Uh, a guy called Umberto Eco. Okay. And, and he's a novelist. Um, and most people probably know that the book he wrote that was turned into a movie called The Name of the Rose. Mm. Um, but he's, um, he's a prolific writer and he writes not just novels, but he's a great commentator and he is one of the most beautiful writers I have ever ever read and what type of books he does he write about? i said he, he writes novels no it's oh, okay sorry um, but he also has a whole series of um commentary he used to write for a coffee magazine actually mm. so he's got a book out called chronicles from a liquid society oh, that's um, a great name. and it's a compilation of articles that he wrote for this uh, magazine mm-hmm. uh and then he's written another book called on literature so he's a great thinker and a ama- and he's just a beautiful. If I could write like him, I I would I would feel content with life. I'm gonna put it in the show notes. This is, sounds very interesting. I'm gonna see if I can. Um... He's amazing. Just a beautiful writer. Yeah, that's 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 great. Great to know. Because um, I, I actually like to read books when I can. Sometimes yep. it's audio books, obviously. Yep. But yeah, I haven't heard of this this author, so I'll definitely check it out and I'll put it in the show notes for all the all the listeners. Jackie, it's been amazing having you on the show, and I look forward to you know staying in touch and you know um, talk to you a- soon absolute again. Absolute pleasure. You have a lovely rest of the weekend, and I'll I look will. forward to yeah talk to you soon again. I'm going yeah, got to go back to writing. <laughs> awesome. And that's a wrap. There we go. We did it. Great. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the end of the Success Inspired Podcast. This was another great interview and I hope you got a lot of value out of my conversation with Jackie and you're already looking at implementing some strategies when it comes to writing your book. Now, on my next uh, episode, my next guest, my next interview is world leader in business development for fitness professionals. He's a founder of Personal Trainer Development Center and Online Trainer Academy also an author of multiple best-selling books for fitness professionals so make sure you don't miss out on that one if you want to make sure that you don't miss out make sure you subscribe Um, there should be a link somewhere in the show notes to subscribe to my mailing list and that way i can keep you updated otherwise make sure you subscribe on the apple podcast that way you get notified when i launch my next interview thank you once again for listening to the end this is vid from success inspired podcast Thank you.